Prize winner for this interview, interview is Nafei Chowdhury, for a, a research fellow at St. Catherine's College, Cambridge University. Um, he was awarded the SLSA Article Prize in 2022 for his article, Order in the Bazaar, The Transformation of Non-State Law in Afghanistan's Premier Money Exchange Market, and that was published in Law and Social Inquiry in 2022. Hi, Nafei. Hi, Richard. Um, uh, my first question then is just to ask you to provide uh, some context for this research. How did you get interested in the activities of Af Afghanistan's money exchanges and decide that you wanted to study it from a socio-legal perspective? Thanks so much, Richard, for having me. And this question requires me to rewind a couple of years. I was previously a law professor at a small private university in Afghanistan, and I was very much a black letter lawyer at that time. So I would teach contracts and torts very much the way it was written in statutes, like uh, as a black letter lawyer would do. And students would come up to me and ask me, you know, does this really matter in a place like Afghanistan where the legal system isn't really working? And I had a, 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 I had a witty response that, uh, well, I mean, if the legal system isn't working, well, then th that's all the reason more you should be empowered to be the um, emissaries of change. And this worked on young, impressionable law students, but wore thin on myself over time because I started to wonder, what is happening in society? How are transactions going on if the legal system isn't really, you know, isn't the way it, it necessarily should be functioning? And so I actually went out into society, talked to businesses, restaurants, uh, shop owners, industries, and I realized that there was this very important market, uh, a money exchange market known as Sarai Shazada, where a lot of the transactions that had to do with the import and export of goods were associated with in some way. And I found this market to be remarkably important despite the fact that it had limited government oversight and it was still able to have a tremendous amount of order. So just to give you an idea about this uh, bazaar very quickly, this money exchange market, which ended up being the focus of this paper and the focus of a large part of my research. If you think about currency exchangers that you sometimes use when you're traveling and need the local currency, you have entire markets dedicated to this in Afghanistan and the central market has about 400 stores spread over four floors, and they're doing all types of uh, transactions such as changing currencies, sending money abroad or sending money domestically from place to place, say, uh, providing savings accounts. And this, is, um, this tremendous amount of activity is done with limited government oversight. Very li little has been written on it. And so I decided one of the ways in which um, I wanted to understand order in this bazaar was by talking to the people who were there and understanding that written and unwritten scripts. And so really figuring out figuring out from the ground up how order is constituted. And a sociolegal method really lended well to that. And so I transformed from a black letter lawyer into a sociolegal researcher. That's fascinating. Um, the article derives then from a significant empirical project. Could you explain your approach and your experiences in carrying out um, the study? Yeah, so my study is very much ethnographic. And so with ethnography, we're spending a lot of time with the community to figure out, um, well, to understand what they're saying and also the unwritten scripts as to how they behave and what are the norms that and, and practices that govern um, activities that are going on. And so the community I was stu studying was this money exchange market. And the actors in that are money exchangers. They're the ones who are actually doing the day-to-day -day currency exchanges. Now, this is this was Afghanistan, this is Afghanistan at the end of the day. So I did have to be cognizant of how I would strategize to study such a place. And I had a couple of strategies in mind. So first of all, I would vary the times of day that I would uh, attend the bazaar as well as the times of the week. So adding a little bit of unpredictability to the extent possible, just so I didn't become, you know, someone seen as a, a frequent a person regularly frequenting the bazaar such that I might attract the attention of criminal gangs, which were in fact, uh, which are in fact a concern in this marketplace. I would also use um, the uh, it, the introduction. I would use people in my own network to introduce me to people who they knew in the marketplace. So sometimes this is this is referred to as snowball um, sampling. So getting introduced by someone, and I would also not just 
focus on the bazaar, but to understand it, I would also look at other sites around the city. So the commercial bank, the central bank, government offices, other marketplaces. And that really provided me a more holistic picture of what it means to have order within this bazaar, how it interacts with these other sites. And I found it at, at the end of the day, you know, tremendously enriching being able to interact with these money exchangers and how warm and welcoming they were both to me and my research. And I had an incredible time interacting with them, even being even while being cognizant of the dangers, uh, the subjective dangers to myself and also to my uh, interlocutors. They themselves also faced um, dangers of uh, cr uh, criminal activity. So um, I think this type of research can get done. One just has to have a plan ahead of time of how they're going to mitigate certain dangers that are present. Um, well, you divide your discussion into three main parts. The emergence of the Union of, union of Exchange, uh, licensing the boundaries of the Union and formalization of the conflict commission. Um, could you give an overview of what you describe and explain? Yeah, so this really gets into the substantive meat of my article. With order in the bazaar, I'm really trying to understand the entanglements that form between state and non-state legal systems. And when I talk about non-state, I'm here I'm talking about the legal system of the bazaar. And that's the understanding I try to construct using the narrative stories and insights of the money exchangers that I spoke to, as well as others um, in Afghanistan. And so uh, the three points that I mentioned talk about uh, legal order and legal transformation that are occurring in this marketplace. First, in the last few years, there's been an emergence of this centralized management structure. And so with this, with, uh, and that's the, the union um, within the marketplace. And so with this first point, what I'm trying to show is that just as the state has been developing since 2001, when a lot of international, international support um, was dedicated to rebuilding the government uh, bureaucracy, so too did the uh, management develop its um, functionalities. So as the state developed um, its functionalities, the bazaar started to feel its encroaching presence. And bazaar actors, exchangers decided that they also had to organize themselves. So in response to the state, they also organized themselves and developed this management structure. So we see that there's somewhat of an antagonistic relationship, but there's also a lot of collaboration that goes on. So, uh, when these exchangers developed their own internal set of rules, they shared those rules with the government to ensure that it was consistent with government regulations and even had a legal form. So it seemed that it was um, it would be um, at the, uh, written in the way any law passed by the government was written. So we see both collaboration and competition going on. Now, second, I look at the um, issue of licenses that are required by that the government requires exchangers to hold. So with licenses, the government is trying to have some type of control, even if nominal, over these money exchangers. And that's why they're requiring these licenses. Exchangers too actually benefit from the presence of licenses, which is somewhat surprising. And the reason it has to go with the detail goes into the details of how these licenses operate uh, function. So for an exchanger to be able to get a license, they actually need the written approval of two existing money exchangers. And that provides money exchangers an incredible amount of control over membership into their authority, into their community. It, so, so what these licenses do then is on the one hand, they give the government legitimacy in the marketplace. And on the other hand, they give exchangers a lot of authority because they end up being the gatekeepers and control who's participating in this community. And my third point had to do with the um, this newly uh, established conflict commission, which is essentially a private court. And so what I show is that there is this private court that's 10 to 15 years old, but if we look at the rules of how it operates procedurally and, substan and substantively, it very much derives from traditional dispute resolution mechanisms that have long existed in Afghanistan and in this marketplace. And so what I'm showing is that there are newly introduced changes like this private court, but it's legitimated by having rules of procedure and substance that are supplied by long existing practices that have been going on for many, many decades. And that's, the, and that's what I'm showing um, with the third point and the private court. 
And so with all of this, I want to show how there is a tremendous amount of order in this marketplace, despite the fact that the uh, state doesn't have a direct presence there. Rather, it's mediated through by the presence of these exchanges themselves. Well, the article is then very clear about how it engages with several important themes in socio-legal theory. Um, what do you see then as the, the article's key contribution? Yeah, for so thanks so much. Yeah, perfect, Richard. I, I'd say there are two main contributions that I'm making. The first has to do, uh, the first is to the private governance literature. And so this is the literature that talks about how private communities are able to govern themselves. And this literature tends to say that in fragile settings, wherever it is, whatever, wherever the case may be, you end up having private or, or private um, communities that act as islands of order in a sea of disorder. So the state is so disorderly that you need these pockets of order. And that's partially correct, but I also wanna provide a corrective and say that even in these fragile settings where the state lacks a lot of functionality, a private order and a private community might still depend on the state to be able to carry out its functions. And so that's kind of the contribution I'm making to private governance. And my second contribution is to the legal pluralism literature. And this literature is very rich on how it talks about how um, different legal um, orders are able to interact in, uh, in a particular social space. And what I want to say is let's not dissolve differences too quickly between legal systems. What I'm showing in my study is that there are entanglements that form between legal systems. So the very reason that these entanglements are forming is because there's difference that um, exists between legal systems and they're not able to... Uh, carry out all of their functionalities, just relying on um, their own system internally. They have to create these linkages. And so what my study shows is that you have differences between legal systems. These entanglements end up bringing them closer together, but they also end up showing how these legal systems remain distinct from one another. And so at the end of the day, end of the day we have legal systems that are coming closer together but at the same time, remaining distinct and apart from one another. And that dual dynamic is really what I'm trying to emphasize vis-a-vis um, -vis the legal pluralism literature. And I suppose just finally, I'm interested in where next for this research. There have been significant developments in Afghanistan since your empirical work. Are you aware, aware of the impact on um, Afghanistan's money exchanges? Oh, yes. I mean, there's been a, trend, a tremendous amount of change in Afghanistan and with these exchangers since um, uh, over the last year. So in August of 2021, the, the, the Republic of Afghanistan fell and the new regime took over the country. And that really took such shock waves throughout society. And money exchanges are included in that. And I think one of the, and I've been in contact with them from the day the country fell to when they reopened their marketplace to just a couple of hours ago. And what's really remarkable about these money exchangers, I think, is their um, their resilience. So, first of all, if we compare money exchanger money exchangers to banks, banks have largely become dysfunctional. I mean, not a single bank is providing loans at the moment, and a number of them have shut down their operations. Money exchanges remain in operation. Now, they're certainly more cautious on how they're using their money, but they're still providing loans, sending money between different places, providing savings accounts. So I think instances like the current moment where you have tremendous change also shows the tremendous amount of adaptability that these money exchangers have. And that's one of the things that I'm studying at the moment. And now I'm also, I've expanded my research interests and I'm also looking at other markets commodity markets in Afghanistan, such as the car sellers market, the used cell phone market, because some of these other markets also have private associations and unions, and uh, some work better than others. And I think we can enrich our understanding of um, these associations in fragile settings by studying these different settings and having an understanding of what are the factors that allow some to be successful in their operation and others to be less so and unable really to uh, create a community amongst their members. And so that's where my research is now taking me and hopefully it provides a more enriching understanding of, of how associations work across um, different, um, different markets. Well, thank you very much, Nafe. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic article. I encourage everybody to um, to read it and I wish you all the best with that, that future research that you described. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for your time today and thanks so much for the questions, Richard.